The bell-shaped curve, the bell-shaped distribution. It's amazing how often this type of pattern happens when you collect data. Something like this, where you, you sort of see it going up to a point and then back down again. So this one's just the height and inches, uh, which we've placed in the class group so we can draw up a nice histogram there. Basically what I'm looking for is this. The distribution has its modal class, so the tallest column if you like, somewhere in the middle. Yeah, okay, that's somewhere in the middle. The distribution is almost symmetrical. And clearly it's not symmetrical, but okay. It's got a bit of a feel about it where it comes down on both. Of course, the perfect symmetrical distribution, the classic bell-shaped curve is that, and, and in that one, the mean, the median, the mode is all the same thing. They all sit right in the middle of the, the data. Ours is not symmetrical, and a lot of them are not when you're collecting real data, but yeah, it's almost symmetrical. But this is the other thing you're looking for in the data, that the frequency density tails off pretty rapidly as you move out. So it sort of comes down to that tail. All right. Which brings us to the perfect one, the classic one, the, what we call the normal distribution. So random variable x, this is the probability density function. And you're going to love it. Look at that beautiful thing right there. There's the function. 1 over sigma root 2 pi times e to the power of minus x minus mu squared all over to sigma squared, then that will be true for all values of x that are real numbers. U, of course, is representing the mean, and sigma squared the, the variance. That is the formula for a normal distribution. Fortunately, we don't have to derive it or anything like that. That's, we just know it to be true. We're more interested in just this notation down the bottom here. If something is normally distributed, this is how we denote it. Our random variable x, we use the tilde, that's sort of saying is distributed, n normal. And then the two key pieces of information we're interested in are the average and the variance. So we put those in parentheses next to it. So that's how we say our random variable is normally distributed. We don't worry about writing down the actual density function. So what are the characteristics? Well, there we go, there's our classic one. It's an even function. Well, it's symmetric. It's got to be an even function. So function x is function negative x. The maximum will be at the average. We said the average is the same as the mode, also the same as the median, so it's right in the middle. Which also means it is symmetric about the average, because they sit in the middle. This is interesting. The inflection point on it always occurs at the first deviation. So either side, obviously, because it's symmetric, but that's where the inflection point will be on our distribution curve there. So that's any normal distribution. Then we break it down even more. There's a standard one that we like to work with, and it's simply when the average is zero and the deviation is one. And you'll notice I've represented it with the random variable z, which of course is where z scores come from. So we often use z for the standard normal distribution. I suppose you don't have to, but that's sort of what we tend to use. And so the tilde is distributed normally 0, 1. Average is 0, variance of 1. That changes the formula to something a little bit nicer. So it just becomes 1 over root 2 pi e to the power of minus z squared on 2. And you'll notice the pronumeral we use there is phi, a lowercase phi. So how do we work out our probabilities then? Remember that awkward function which we don't want to play with? Well, this is what it is. Z less than or equal to Z, so our cumulative, would be equal to, and now you'll notice it's capital phi. So the capital represents the cumulative one. And there's the formula. But again, you don't have to work that out, and there's good reasons why. But yeah, capital phi, as I say, it represents the cumulative distribution function. Okay. There's the graph. That's what it would look like. So it's nice and shallow, then it gets up steep, and then it ends up shallow again. So how do we go about integrating this little phi z, the probability density function? Well, we can't. Not with what we know anyway. So at the moment, we're sort of limited to algebraic functions, trig functions, exponential functions, also limited in the different integration methods that we've seen. So that function is a bit hard for us to, to integrate. It's a bit hard for most people to integrate, to be honest. So we don't. But we don't need to. 
because remember we're dealing with definite integrals we're actually not interested in what the function is we're interested in the answer when we substitute into the function and someone has done the hard work for us and that's where those table of values comes from could be estimated using the trapezoidal rule but this is why we always go to the standard normal distribution imagine if we had to have a set of tables for every possible normal distribution you couldn't i mean there's an infinite number so we bring everything back to the standard one and we just have a set of tables for the standard one so that way we can just look up in the table what the the answer is so there's an abbreviated version of it and so if I wanted to find the probability that Z was less than or equal to 0.25, in other words, capital Phi 0.25, I would just look it up in my table. Well, 0.2, and then I'll go across to 0.05, they intersect, 0.5987 is the answer. There's the answer. So I don't have to worry about integrating the function and substituting in. It's like someone has done the hard work for us. So using our table then, how do we manipulate it to get different answers? So we just saw, well, if we want to find probability of Z less than or equal to a particular value, we just look up the table and go, right, there it is. But of course, the table only has positive numbers in it, but it's a symmetric graph. So if I want to find the cumulative up to a negative number, then I can say it's 1 minus a positive number. In a similar way, if I wanted to do greater than, well, greater than would be the same as the negative one. Between two values, and we do that a lot, well, it's simply the Z2 minus the Z1. We just subtract those values. And then I'm saying is a value between the positive and negative, then it could be done via this substitution from the other ones could show it but two times the cumulative up to z but then you subtract one so it all depends what type of calculator you have hands up those people who have the lovely 100 au plus congratulations hands up those who don't have the 100 au plus don't go out and buy one all right <laughs> but the 100 au plus can do it for you uh, the tables are sort of in the calculator okay? those that do have it if you go mode three now that should clear out the data so mode three and then ac so all clear so you've got your calculator in stats mode and you've cleared out any previous data that might be in there if you go shift one five that will bring up the standard normal distribution menu to choose from there are three things it will do you see P, Q and R, it's labelled. P finds the cumulative up to a point. Q finds from zero up to a point. And R is going greater than. So, no, I'm not saying 1 minus 0.25 here. I'm then saying, well, so if you were to press 1, which would access P, and go 0.25, then it would find what we just looked up on the table uh, for the cumulative up to 0.25. Of course, it does it to more accuracy because calculator gives you more digits. It comes back with 0.59871. So if we want to find Z is less than or equal to 0.44, I can now put it into the calculator or I could look it up in the table. We'll get 0.67003. If we want to find probability Z less than or equal to negative 0.81, calculator fine I can put it straight in the tables I can't so I would have to go all right I'll work out one minus and then in the table I would look up 0.81 and we'd end up with our our answer or of course as I say you could just go straight in the calculator bang it brings you the answer out I want to go in between these two values then I would go 0.94 that's fine I can read that straight from the table but then I'm going minus minus two th three four so I'm going to have to do a process to get that one if I'm not using a calculator but once I do eventually I can get the answer still going to be a heck of a lot quicker than integrating absolute value so in between minus 1.15 and positive 1.15 then that would be two look up 1.15 subtract one we get the answer brings me to the empirical rule and as I was saying you'll find these numbers come up a lot for the sake of exams to make life easier it's this sort of idea uh, there's the, the normal distribution and uh, and you know some of this already that in the normal distribution 68% of data will lie in the range plus or minus one deviation 
So if we're talking about z-scores, a z-score between minus 1 and plus 1. 95% of the data will be two deviations away from the mean, and virtually all of the data is within three deviations of the mean. So that means if you read your z-score and it's more than three, you're punching the sky, but if it's less than minus three, I got a box of tissues. Okay, there we go. 16D, let's play with the normal distribution.